Today we're going to introduce the special theory of relativity. And I just want to give you a few landmarks, because if you've got a few landmarks, you'll have a much better sense of orientation as you try to navigate your way through the special theory of relativity. So what are some of the landmarks in the special theory of relativity? Well, first of all, it's only significant when you have really high speeds. You have to have speeds that are comparable to the speed of light. So we need relative motion with speeds of the order 3 times 10 to the 8th meters per second, or about 300,000 kilometers per second. So we're talking about speeds here that are not part of our everyday life. And then there's three basic effects when we have relative motion. One would be called mass increase. Two, called time dilation. Time will slow down. And three is length contraction. Now sometimes I'll hear students say, it seems like lengths contract when there's relative motion between objects. That makes it seem like an optical illusion. And it's not an optical illusion. Let me show you what I mean by that. Here I've got a meter stick. And I've built kind of a doghouse here, but it's got a hinged door at each end. And the doghouse, as you can see, is a little bit shorter than my ruler. It sticks out the ends. But let's suppose now that we're going to move the meter stick at high speeds, at relativistic speeds, through our doghouse. If we do that, we can open up the two hinge doors, move our meter stick at really high speeds, and for an instant, you're going to be able to close both doors of the doghouse and the meter stick will fit inside. At least if you're going fast enough with that meter stick. Now you're going to have to open those doors really, really quickly because our meter stick is moving really, really quickly. But what I want you to realize here, this is not an optical illusion. That meter stick is really fitting in to the length of the doghouse, even though the meter stick is longer than the doghouse. Let's take a little deeper look at these three effects and see why this is called the special theory of relativity. So let's imagine we have two sets of a clock, a meter stick, and a one kilogram mass. And we're going to put one set on a rocket ship. We'll make the rocket ship move at a relativistic speed, v. And we'll put the other set on the Earth. And then we're going to put a couple twins, one in the rocket ship and one twin on the Earth. Now, let's suppose the twin on the Earth looks up and can see what's going on inside the rocket ship. We can imagine that things weren't just a blur because it was moving by so quickly. What he would say is, brother, my twin, you're moving in slow motion. Your clock is moving more slowly than mine. Twin, you look really skinny. Have you been eating well? Or he might say, your meter stick looks shorter than mine. And if he could shine some sort of laser and try to accelerate his twin brother, he would say, you're harder to accelerate. You've got more mass than I've got. Your one kilogram mass is heavier than my one kilogram mass. But what makes this the theory of relativity is when the second twin on the rocket ship looks back to Earth. Because what he's going to say is, dude, you've got it all wrong. It's you who are moving in slow motion. It's your clock that's running slow. And it's you who's too skinny. Your meter stick is too short. And you're the one that's hard to accelerate. And it's this symmetry between the two frames that makes this the theory of relativity. It's really saying that motion can be measured just as well from one reference frame as from another reference frame. And this symmetry, as innocent as it might seem, leads to all these special effects in the theory of relativity. Now the next question you're probably asking yourselves is, 
how big is this effect? Well, let's assume we have a relative speed of 86% the speed of light. So we've got V equal to 0 0.86 times the speed of light, which is about 2.6 times 10 to the 8th meters per second, which is what, 260,000 kilometers every second. If that was our speed, then we'd get a mass increase by a factor of 2. And we'd get a length contraction by a factor of 2 also. And you could probably guess by what factor the time slows by. Once again, it's 2. And of course, we're going to want to have a formula that's going to generate that factor for different fractions of the speed of light. And that formula is called the Lorenz formula. So let's write down the Lorenz formula. It starts with this gamma here, and that's the factor that we've been talking about. And it goes by different names. It's sometimes called the gamma factor because this is the Greek letter gamma. It's also called the relativistic factor or the Lorenz factor. But it's all the same factor. On the other side of the equation, you're going to get an expression in terms of the, the fraction of the speed of light. So it's going to be 1 over the square root of 1 minus, there's the fraction, v over c squared. Let's try graphing gamma here. So gamma is equal to 1 over 1 minus v over c all squared. So we're going to plot gamma on the y-axis and the ratio of the speed of light on the x-axis. You're going to get a horizontal asymptote at 1 and also a vertical asymptote at 1. The horizontal asymptote here, that's because gamma is always bigger than 1. And so if the speed is equal to 0, Gamma will be exactly equal to 1. But basically, for any small value of v compared to c, gamma is going to be incredibly close to 1. We also get this vertical asymptote at 1 because nothing with mass can go faster than the speed of light. And that's because if I put v equal to c, I get a 1 in the bottom. That means you're going to divide by 0, and that gives you infinity. And that means your masses would be infinitely increased. You'd have infinite mass. Well, of course, it's impossible to accelerate something with infinite mass, and that means nothing can go faster than the speed of light. So you're going to get a curve that kind of runs along the x-axis, and then has that vertical asymptote as v approaches the speed of light. So not so long ago, I told you at 86% the speed of light at 0 0.86. Gamma was equal to approximately 2. So let's put that point in. And let me pick out another point here. If you put the fraction of the speed of light to be 0.2 or 20% the speed of light, you'll find that gamma comes out to be 1.02. In other words, it's only a 2% increase. We have hardly any increase in gamma up to about 20% the speed of light. And if you go all the way up here to 0.98% the speed of light, you'll get up to a gamma factor of about 5. So your curve is going to look approximately like that. As you get close to the speed of light, gamma gets big very quickly. But maybe for practical purposes, for our purposes, you need to get up to about 20% the speed of light. That's about 60,000 kilometers per second before you're starting to get significant relativistic effects. Some people get really excited when you mention the topic of relativity. Lots of ooing and aahing. What is it that makes relativity so mind-boggling? What I'd like you to think about is the first Superman movie starring Christopher Reeves. Now, near the end of the movie, he gets really, really angry, and he flies around the Earth faster and faster and faster. He goes so fast he causes the Earth to rotate backwards and somehow that causes time to reverse and the chain of events reverses. Well, that's not great physics and there's nothing in relativity that says time can go backwards. But this image from the movie did make me think about Superman approaching the speed of light and what would happen. So let's consider our three effects as Superman approaches the speed of light. So the first thing that's going to happen is time will slow. The people on the Earth are going to move more and more slowly, and eventually time stands still. Now, if time stands still, Superman's going to have enough time to learn everything about everyone on Earth. In other words, he can become all-knowing or omniscient. 
And of course, if time's not advancing for the people on Earth, then Superman is going to be eternal for them. Let's consider length contraction. So the continents shrink and shrink and shrink in the direction of Superman's motion. Eventually, as he approaches the speed of light, we could imagine his pupil being long enough to wrap itself all the way around the Earth. In other words, Superman can be everywhere at once. He can be omnipresent. So length contraction leads to omnipresence. Thirdly, there's going to be mass increase. As he approaches the speed of light, the mass of people is going to become infinite. And that means he's not going to be able to exert any effective forces. He's going to become ghost-like because he can't put a force on anything. So I find it very mind-blowing that if you take Superman, speed him up close to the speed of light, and he becomes godlike. Now, I don't know what it means. It is awfully speculative, but I find it cool. And I do find it mind-blowing, and I do find it enjoyable. And let me end the video on that note. And that's all for today, folks. Thank you very much.